I'm Eric Gadman with uh, Snow King Watershed Council, and this is water chemistry monitoring. And we've talked a little bit about Snow King Watershed Council. We're a local all volunteer nonprofit organization working to help people protect local creeks and natural areas. We're also part of a larger organization, Global Water Watch, that uh, teaches people to do uh, water monitoring and help protect their water in different places around the world. Today we're going to talk about just touch briefly on basic concepts about watersheds, water pollution, and then we're going to get into techniques for physical and chemical monitoring. So again, uh, water monitoring is kind of a systematic evaluation assessment of conditions in the water to help you understand the health of a watershed. And you may do it for different reasons. You may do it because you want to help educate people. You may want to do it because you want to help improve the water quality. You may want to do it as part of a scientific study, or you may do it because it's necessary by regulation. Different people do it, ranging from community groups to scientific groups to government agencies. Um, typically at the stream location and you can sample either the water itself or you can be sampling the substrate and there's different ways and techniques that you monitor and we will get into some of those different techniques today. So again, uh, just to review the concept of a watershed, a watershed is an area of land that drains to a common point, typically a stream or a lake or a larger body of water. And one of the issues that we have in watersheds is stormwater, which most many people are not aware goes into uh, storm drains, which then go into streams. And what you find is in an urban setting, you have a lot faster runoff and a lot less groundwater recharge than what you have in more of a rural setting. It can contain a variety of toxic compounds, including uh, chemicals from tire rubber that are implicated in uh, urban stream mortality syndrome. So stormwater is one of the biggest issues that we have. There's different things that people can do themselves to reduce water pollution. Uh, they can build rain gardens. They can restore stream buffers. They can make sure they pick up their pet waste, fix their vehicles so they don't leak oil. They can avoid fertilizers and chemicals in their yard, do things to limit runoff from their property. So there's a number of different things that people can do. Okay, we're gonna get into the details of water chemistry monitoring. This is a, a slide that shows some of the different water quality variables that are commonly monitored. And so these, this set of variables right here go to uh, constitute something called the water quality index. And that's a, a index that's used to give a, a numeric score for a water body. And so we monitor most, but not all of these. Some of these are more difficult to monitor as a volunteer monitoring program, but for agencies that do professional water monitoring, these are what they monitor. And we'll get into a discussion of what each of these different variables represents. There's different ways that you can collect the data. So one example is with a meter. And so this is a, an electronic meter, which has a probe and a display with control. So you would uh, calibrate this meter and drop it into a stream and then it will give you a relatively instantaneous reading. You can also collect samples and take them back to a laboratory uh, and do some analysis on it there. You can have uh, a uh, continuous uh, meter that's connected to some kind of uh, data transmitter. So like a continuous data logger that might log variables like temperature, turbidity, flow. And these are sometimes set up uh, by government agencies to monitor local water bodies. And you also have uh, volunteer based programs that can use uh, test kits like what we use, which are essentially little inexpensive uh, chemical titration based tests. So the pluses and minuses of the different techniques. Uh, with an electronic meter, uh, the plus is that uh, it's very quick. 
and very uh, accurate. Uh, the downside is that they're expensive. Uh, this type of probe right here costs a few thousand dollars by itself and it needs calibration uh, with specific calibration fluids every time you're gonna go out and use it. Um, and just the maintenance of it annually is pretty expensive. And this is an example of one that we have that we've loaned out to a, a youth group working with Puget Soundkeeper. And they can, you can get probes to measure a variety of different variables ranging from um, all the ones shown here to uh, other, other variables. Um, and they can give you a very, like I said, a very detailed, very accurate listing. Uh, <clears throat> this is another piece of equipment that we use, which is called a photometer. And this is something where we collect a sample and then we put it into a little glass tube and put it into this machine, um, mix it with a reagent, and it analyzes the, uh, the way that that reagent affects the light and it gives you a very detailed reading on different types of chemicals. So we use this for nitrate and phosphate and copper. So this is something that we periodically collect data on, our, on the streams we monitor. This is the equipment which is used for water chemistry monitoring with global water watch techniques. And it consists primarily of a test kit made by Lamont, along with a few other odds and ends that you need to monitor. The way that this kit is laid out is um, there's it's grouped into areas based on the different types of tests that you're going to run. So you can kind of see the color coding, all the things that are relating to the pH test are green, all the items that relate to the dissolved oxygen test are yellow and so on. That's just generally how the, the kit is organized, which if you keep it organized that way, it helps you uh, pull things out quickly when you're doing your tests in the field. In terms of doing the monitoring, there's some general principles that you want to follow. First one is you want to basically follow the directions carefully. So you want to have a set of written directions with you, because um, if you forget a step, your test's not going to turn out right. And so that's step one is follow the directions. The tests in the Lamont kit use things known as reagents. And this example here is sulfuric acid. Each of the reagents has an expiration date. And so one of the things you want to do is before you go out monitoring, you want to take a look at the kit and make sure that none of the reagents are expired as that could affect your test as well. A couple of other general principles are to write down your results as you go along. So write them down on the data sheet and then to record the data when you're done. And so um, assuming that you become a monitor with Global Water Watch, you'll be assigned a user ID and a username that'll get you into the Global Water Watch database where you can enter your data. As a best practice, we don't dump out the reagents that we use uh, at the stream, but we collect them and bring them back. And they're, they're sufficiently diluted and not generally hazardous. So they can go down the, into the sanitary sewer back at your home or office. Another general principle or saying that we use is having no information is better than having wrong information. So if you think you may have skipped a step or done something wrong, you wanna do the test over. It helps when you're doing monitoring to keep things organized and you can use the kit itself to hold the various test tubes while you're conducting tests so that the, uh, the tubes don't tip over, spill and make you have to start your tests over again. There's a number of different tubes that you're going to use to collect water samples and do tests. And when you're filling the tubes with water, you're going to be asked to fill them to a certain level. When you look in the tube, you'll see that the surface of the water makes a curve. The bottom of the curve is referred to as the meniscus. You want the meniscus, the bottom of the meniscus to be even with the level line which you're filling to. And if you overfill a bit, the easiest way to get back to the right level is to what we call flick 
the water out and we'll show you that technique, but it's an easy way to get rid of just a very small amount of water to get yourself down to the right level. Okay, some monitoring tips. So one of the main things you're gonna be doing, these are all, or not all, but most of the tests are titration based tests, which means you're adding a little bit of something until you see a change. And uh, so you're gonna be dispensing drops from these reagent bottles. So one technique is you wanna squeeze the bottle, turn it upside down, i.e. invert it, and then release it so it draws in a little air, then start dispensing the drops. Otherwise, they may come out too quick, quickly for you to count. So remember, squeeze, invert, release, dispense, and we'll demonstrate this for you. Another concept is the concept of a titration endpoint. So these are titration-based reactions. So in other words, you're adding a little bit of something to a chemical solution until you see a color change. And so here you can see we're doing the hardness test and it starts off as kind of the pink color. And then as we're adding the hardness reagent, <clears throat> it starts to get darker and darker. And then it continues to change until it comes into kind of a dark blue. And so the way that you determine your titration endpoint is you keep adding drops until you don't see any more color change. And then you don't count the last drop. So in other words, you count the last drop that caused a change, then you add one more drop, but you don't count that last drop. And that's your titration endpoint. So if four drops, you got all the color change you're gonna do, you add one more drop, that's five drops, but you didn't get any more color change, then you count that as four drops that you added to get you to the titration endpoint. So uh, one of the things that we monitor is air and water temperature. And that's a really important variable in particular water temperature because it can have a big effect on uh, the water, the properties of the water and how suitable that water is for things that live in the water. One of the main reasons why it's important is that cold water holds more dissolved oxygen than warm water. And so there's certain species of fish um, in particular locally, what we call salmonids, which are salmon, trout, and steelhead that need very cold water, and they also need um, higher dissolved oxygen. So uh, temperature is a key variable. And in fact, um, on the Sammamish River, which comes into Lake Washington, uh, it is a very slow moving river and it has a tendency to warm up. It doesn't have a lot of shading and it's actually considered to be a thermal barrier to salmon migration. So temperature is very important. Oh, and I didn't add that this is a chart from the Washington Administrative Code. So this is essentially the, the, the water temperature standards for specific salmonids um, that are in uh, Washington law. Okay, some monitoring tips. Uh, if you look at the thermometer, you can see that it has like a, what we call an eyelet end where the string is, and it has what we call a bulb end, which is the other end that has little holes in it. So you wanna hold it by the eyelet end where the string is, where the little loop is, because then uh, if you hold it by the other end, the warmth of your hands might affect the temperature. So you wanna hold it by the eyelet. If you're using only one thermometer, you wanna measure the air temperature first, and then the water temperature, because if you dip it in the water first and then it's evaporating, you theoretically, you could get some evaporative cooling that could affect your temperature reading. And we record the temperature in Celsius and our thermometers are just accurate enough to show you to the nearest uh, 0.5 unit. So that's what we uh, record them in. Okay, we're gonna watch a quick demonstration video. So I'm going to stop sharing for a second and click over to the video. And first I'll just pause for a second and see, does anybody have any questions right now? Um, I was curious to know what kind of reagents are like sort of used, I guess for like just the last example for the titration. Mm -hmm. You mean what are the actual chemicals? Yeah. Um, 
there's about, I don't know, seven or eight different chemicals that are used. So um, for example, sulfuric acid is one that's probably the most hazardous of the reagents, um, manganese sulfate. Um, there's a bunch of different chemicals I could, and I could, we'll, we'll get through what all the different uh, chemicals are as we go through each of the tests. Um, okay. but they're, not, they're not generally super hazardous with the exception of the sulfuric acid. That's good, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so the first one we're gonna watch is a video on air and water temperature. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch instructional video series. This video will show the proper method for taking air and water temperatures. Before arriving at the site, make sure there are no separations or breaks in the thermometer's alcohol column. If there is a break, your readings will be inaccurate. We will start with air temperature. Always take air temperature before water temperature for the most accurate readings. Upon arrival at the site, place the dry thermometer in the shade until the temperature stabilizes. This will usually take two to three minutes. Once the temperature stabilizes, hold the thermometer by the eyelet to avoid touching the bulb. Read and record the temperature to the nearest half degree Celsius on your data form. For water temperature, submerge the thermometer in the water until the temperature stabilizes, or about two to three minutes. It may be necessary to anchor the thermometer to prevent loss in strong currents, cloudy water, or deep water. This can be done by tying a cord through the eyelet and attaching it to a stable object. When the temperature stabilizes, read the thermometer while it is still submerged or immediately after removing it from the water. Record the temperature to the nearest half degree Celsius on your data form. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, give us a shout. Any questions on that one? That's a pretty easy one. Okay, so the um, next test we're going to talk about is pH. So just some general concepts about pH. So pH is a measure of acid and base. Scale goes from 0 to 14. 7 is considered to be neutral. And most things like to, most living things like to exist pretty close to neutral. The optimum for fish is from 6 to 8.5. And this is something where unless there's something really unusual going on with the water body, you're typically not going to find pH outside of that uh, range. So the way that we do the test is there's a little test tube in the kit that you'll uh, use this particular test, this particular tube. Uh, you're going to rinse it three times with sample water and then you fill it up to a 10 milliliter line, which is near the top of that particular tube. Then you'll add 10 drops of a solution that's called wide range indicator. Uh, you invert it a few times to mix it after you put a lid on it, and then you hold it up. Uh, that's just showing it mixed. Uh, it's gonna turn kind of a greenish color, typically depending on the pH. And then you'll put it in a little color indicator and uh, compare what color you have. And that shows you the sample, uh, it shows you the pH. So it's and it kind of helps sometimes to have a couple different people there just to look at it and go, okay, I'm seeing 7.5. Are you seeing 7.5? Yep, that's what I'm seeing and, and agree on your result. And there's a little uh, Alabama Water Watch uh, video we can watch on pH. So I'm gonna switch over to that. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch instructional video series. This video will show the proper method for measuring pH with two different Lamont testing kits, one from before and after 2013.
For this test, you will need the wide range indicator, the small tube with cap, and the color comparators. Remove the small tube from your kit and rinse two to three times with water from your site. Fill the tube above the line with site water and flick out excess until the bottom of the meniscus touches the five milliliter line. This is your sample. I'm skipping us ahead a little bit because we don't use that uh, older version, we use the, more, the newer version. For this test, you will need a wide range indicator, small plastic tube with cap, and the OctaSlide viewer with both OctaSlide color bars. Remove the small plastic tube from your kit and rinse two to three times with water from your site. Fill the tube above the line with site water and flick out excess until the bottom of the meniscus touches the 10 milliliter line. This is your sample. Locate the wide range indicator bottle in your kit. Add 10 drops to your sample. When dispensing the reagent, take care to hold the dropper bottle vertically. This ensures uniform size drops. Cap and invert the tube two to three times to mix. The color will be pastel or pale. Insert the tube into the Octa Slide viewer and match the color of the water. It is helpful to hold the viewer up to a well-lit uniform background, such as a clear patch of sky. You may need to change the OctaSlide color bar to find the best match. Record the pH to the nearest half unit. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, give us a shout. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch instructional video series. This video will show the proper method for determining water hardness. If you are testing in coastal waters, be sure Sorry about that. Skipping ahead. Okay, uh, any questions on the pH? Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is hardness, which is basically you're looking at the concentration of calcium and magnesium in the water. And so a certain amount of that is needed for living organisms, um, for making bones, for metabolic activities. And it's also an indicator of sort of what is the overall mineral content in <clears throat> water. So around here, we don't tend to have very hard water. Um, but uh, depending on if you're somewhere that has like a lot of uh, limestone and sandstone, then you might tend to have harder water. So some parts of the country have harder water than others. Uh, another thing that we'll find is it can help you if you just look at what your hardness is compared to your baseline, you can kind of find out how much water input there is in a stream compared with normal. So if normally you get a certain number, what you find is when maybe things are a little drier, your hardness, relative hardness may go up. Um, <clears throat> or if there's a lot of storm water, your hardness may go down. So we've got a little uh, video here to talk about how to do the hardness test sure to conduct a salinity test first. If salinity is detected, do not perform the hardness test. For this test, you will need the hardness tube, hardness reagent number five, hardness reagent number six tablets, and hardness reagent number seven. Remove the hardness tube from your kit. Rinse the tube two to three times with water from your site. Fill the tube above the line with site water and flick out excess until the bottom of the meniscus touches the line. This is your 10 parts per million sample.
Locate the hardness reagent number 5 bottle. Add 5 drops to your sample and mix. When dispensing the reagent, take care to hold the dropper bottle vertically. This ensures uniform size drops. Locate the hardness reagent number 6 tablet bottle. This reagent is in tablet form and is very soluble. Take extra care to not touch the tablet or allow any water to enter the tablet bottle. Using the cap of the bottle, dispense a single tablet into the water sample. Cap and shake the tube until the tablet dissolves. A pink color will develop. If a blue color develops, there is no measurable hardness and the value should be recorded as zero milligrams per liter. Locate the hardness reagent number seven bottle. Add one drop of reagent at a time, swirling to mix between each. Be sure to allow time between drops for color change to occur, especially during cold weather. You will need to know how many drops you add to your sample, so don't forget to count. Continue adding single drops of the reagent until the pink color changes to blue and eventually no longer changes with any addition. Do not count the last drop if there is no color change after its addition. Multiply the number of drops added by 10 to calculate the hardness value in milligrams per liter. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, give us a shout. Okay, the next test that we do that's somewhat related to hardness <clears throat> is the alkalinity test. And this is sometimes the confusing concept, but it's basically a measure of the buffering capacity of water, which is, means its ability to resist changes in pH. So for instance, if you had water that had no buffering or no alkalinity and you added uh, an acid to it, it would tend to become, uh, have more of a change, become more acidic than if you had one that had a higher buffering capability, you added that same amount of acid, you'd have less of an effect on the pH. So essentially it kind of mitigates and, and dampens that change. Uh, there's a couple different ions that are typically sources of alkalinity in water. And so this is just a chart that gives you an example of some different alkalinity levels. And it's interesting that there's a relationship between alkalinity and hardness, but it's not always the exact same depending on where you go around the country. So like on the East Coast in, in down in the South in Alabama, they find that they may have a, a one to two relationship between their hardness and alkalinity, where here we have that kind of relationship with the amount of drops, but essentially when you compare the numbers, um, our our alkalinity is usually pretty moderate and corresponds more closely with our hardness numbers. Okay, now we'll take a look at a video to how to do um, that test. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch instructional video series. This video will show the proper method for measuring alkalinity. For this test, you will need the alkalinity test tube, BCG MR tablets, alkalinity titration reagent B, and a plastic dropper with no line. Remove the alkalinity test tube from your kit. Rinse the tube two to three times with water from your site. Fill the tube above the 10 milliliter line with site water and flick out excess 
until the bottom of the meniscus touches the 10 milliliter line. Locate the BCG MR tablet bottle. This reagent is in tablet form and is very soluble. Take extra care to not touch the tablet or allow any water to enter the tablet bottle. Use the cap of the tablet bottle and dispense a single tablet into the water sample. Cap and shape the tube until the tablet dissolves. A blue-green color will develop. If a pink or pink-gray color develops, there is no measurable alkalinity and the value should be recorded as zero milligrams per liter. Locate the plastic dropper with the orange or black bulb. Also, locate alkalinity titration reagent B. Fill the dropper with the reagent. Hold the dropper vertically and add one drop at a time to the water sample in the tube. Swirl to mix between each drop. Be sure to allow time between drops for color change to occur, especially during cold weather. You will need to know how many drops you add to your sample, so don't forget to count. Continue adding single drops of the reagent until the blue-green color changes to pink and eventually no longer changes with any addition. Do not count the last drop when there is no color change after its addition. Refill the dropper when needed to ensure uniform size drops. Multiply the number of drops added by five to calculate a total alkalinity value in milligrams per liter. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, give us a shout. Welcome. Okay, any questions so far? No? Okay, all right, we'll continue on. So the next test that we're going to talk about is what we call turbidity, which is essentially a measure of how clear or how cloudy the water is. So if the water is very cloudy, you'd say it has higher turbidity. Things that can cause the water to be turbid can come from natural sources or human caused sources, but typically it involves dirt, mud, things like that, that are running off into the water. Could be erosion of a stream bank could cause turbidity or it could be somebody who's been digging up dirt in a construction area and it's raining on the construction site and the water's running off into the stream. That's an example of what were, uh, happened in that picture there is that dirt was running off of a construction site which caused Little Swamp Creek, the creek that I live on, to become very turbid. And in streams it can cause harm for fish and other aquatic life. Uh, salmon uh, dig these things called reds, which are basically little um, egg nests in the gravel, and they need to have clean gravel with water flowing through it. And if you have high turbidity uh, chronically in a, in a stream, what you can find is it, you can uh, bury those reds. So that's a, one example of an effect of turbidity. The other thing is that attached to that dirt are uh, bacteria, metals, and other pollutants. And so what you find is high turbidity events are also associated with um, high levels of other types of pollution. There's a couple different types of units of measurement. And um, 
there's a couple different scales. So one is what's called JTUs. And this is what comes standard in the Global Water Watch kits. And the other unit is called NTUs. And really the reason why they exist is that uh, JTUs are, they're more of a historic unit of measurement. They've been around for a long time. Uh, they're part of the standard Global Water Watch uh, Lamont kit. Uh, so they're useful for monitoring and establishing a baseline and comparing where you what you're finding to your normal baseline. And it's an easy portable test. What we found was that if you want to talk to a regulatory agency about turbidity, they don't really speak in terms of NTUs. They speak in terms of NT. They don't speak in terms of JTUs. They speak in terms of NTUs, which is nephilometric turbidity units. Good crossword puzzle word for you to remember. But um, that's the unit that they're used to communicating in. So if you wanted to report something, you would report it in NTUs. And we'll get into the details of how you do both these tests here in a second. So specifically with the, the JTU tubes, there's two tubes. One is labeled uh, C for control and one's for sample. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna collect uh, water, depending on the clarity of the water, you'll either use uh, 50 milliliters as kind of an upper line or 25 as a lower line to collect a sample of water. And then you can see at the, the image there, you can see kind of a dot down in the bottom and what you do is you look down the tubes and you fill the control tube with essentially tap water or bottled water. And you look down the two tubes and you compare the clarity of the, the dot. And in some cases, if you have higher turbidity in your sample, you'll have to add reagent to your control to make it as cloudy or more cloudy than the sample. And that's essentially what you do is you continue to add measured increments of standard turbidity reagent to the control and then compare results until you ultimately identify, okay, I needed to add, I added four, made it more turbid than the sample. So I'm gonna count that as three additions and that gives you a number for GTUs. So we'll take a look at a little Alabama Water Watch video that talks about how to do measurement for JTUs for turbidity. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch instructional video series. This video will show the proper method for determining the turbidity of a water body. For this test, you will need turbidity columns, standard turbidity reagent, stirring rod, and bottled, distilled, or tap water. Locate the turbidity columns in your kit. Fill one column to the 50 milliliter line with sample water. Flip down through the column and locate the black dot on the bottom. If the dot is not visible, empty and refill the column to the 25 milliliter line. If the dot is still not visible, record turbidity as too high to measure, or THTM, in the comments section of your data form. Fill the second turbidity column with an equal amount of bottled, distilled, or tap water. This is your control column. It may be helpful to label one of the turbidity columns as sample and the other as control to avoid confusion. Place the columns side by side on a firm level surface and look down through them to compare the clarity or fuzziness of the black dots. Do not consider watercolor. Locate the standard turbidity reagent. Shake the bottle vigorously, then add half a milliliter of the reagent to the control column. Mix the contents of both columns with the stirring rod, tapping the rod to remove excess water between stirrings. Place the two columns side by side on a firm level surface and look down through them to compare the clarity or fuzziness of the black dots. Remember not to consider watercolor. If the control dot is less fuzzy than the sample, add half a milliliter of turbidity reagent at a time to the control column. Between each addition, stir the contents of both columns and vigorously shake the turbidity reagent bottle. You will need to know how many additions you add to the control column, so don't forget to count. Okay. 
Once the control dot is fuzzier than the sample, record the number of additions, not counting the last addition. For example, if just one addition of turbidity reagent makes the control column dot fuzzier than the sample column dot, record as zero additions. In this case, three additions of turbidity reagent made the control column dot fuzzier than the sample column dot, so we would record it as two additions. Use the number of measured additions of turbidity reagent to find the corresponding turbidity value on the chart in your water chemistry manual. Be sure to read the column on the chart corresponding to the original sample volume of either 50 milliliters or 25 milliliters. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, give us a shout. Okay, any questions on that one? Are you gonna, is there a standard as far as you want us to use 25 or 50 milliliters on that sample? So what you find is if the water is pretty good, has pretty good clarity, you know, low turbidity, then you'll use a larger sample because when you look down through it, you can see that dot easily on the bottom. If it's so cloudy that you can't see that dot or you just generally have cloudier water, then you'll use a smaller sample because um, otherwise what will happen is, well, first of all, you have to be able to see the dot. So that's basically why you use the smaller, a smaller sample. So more turbid, smaller sample. Okay. All right. We'll continue on to the next test or next uh, test that we do. So we also have a turbidity tube that measures an NTUs. We have a couple different versions of it, but they essentially do the same thing. So it's essentially a large plexiglass tube. Uh, it's about 60 centimeters long that has a chart laminated on it and a way that you can drain water out of it. And in the bottom, there's a little black and white disc that's called a Secchi disc. So you wanna gather your water, ideally in a separate container, although you can just gather it in this container um, the only reason to gather it in a separate container is sometimes it's difficult to fill this to the top when you're just laying it on its side in the, in the creek. And you're going to pour water in until you can't see the disc. So you're looking down directly through the top and if you want to pour water until you cannot see the disc on the bottom. And then you'll release water with that drain until you can see the disc and you'll go, okay, what is my water level now? So you, you look at it on the side and these tubes measure, this version measures in centimeters. So then there's a chart that says, okay, if it was uh, between 10.5 to 12 centimeters, that means it was a hundred NTUs. So you record that as your NTU reading. We have another one that's very similar uh, the only difference is this one directly reads in NTUs. And so on this one, again, you fill it up, you look down through it until you can just see the uh, Secchi disc. So, and the way you let water out of this one is you just push it. It has a little valve on the bottom. You just push it straight down. And in this case, you just look on the side and the NTUs are, there's a chart right on the tube that tells you the NTUs. So that's how that one works. Okay, if there's no questions on that, we'll move ahead to talking about dissolved oxygen. So dissolved oxygen is uh, super important. It's kind of like the oxygen in the air we breathe, but it's what's in the water that the creatures that live in the water need. There's a couple different ways it gets in the water. One is just aeration of the, the water, um, like going over a waterfall or something like that. And that's one way that it gets in there. And the other is that plants release oxygen during photosynthesis. And that's another way that dissolved oxygen gets in there. It's pretty important because different things that live in the water need different levels of dissolved oxygen. And typically what we find is that like things that are adapted to warm, slow water don't need very high dissolved oxygen where uh, trout and other what we call salmonids that are adapted to cold water need higher dissolved oxygen. Another principle about dissolved oxygen is that 
there's a what we call an inverse relationship between temperature and dissolved oxygen. So in other words, colder water holds more dissolved oxygen, warmer water holds less dissolved oxygen. So this is just a graph of uh, Global Water Watch uh, site showing uh, plotting dissolved oxygen against temperature and you can see the relationship there. So we'll just walk through the basic steps and then we'll watch a demonstration video. The basic steps are one, you're collecting the sample. And so what you wanna do with this is you have two bottles that you're gonna use. And the reason why you collect two bottles is you're essentially gonna do the test twice and compare your results. And your two results have to be within a certain margin of each other. Otherwise, uh, you're, you haven't necessarily done the test accurately enough or some variables got in there, so you're gonna redo the test. So this is the one test that we sort of uh, self-check uh, on itself as you're doing the test. So you have two sample bottles. You're gonna fill them up underwater and you're gonna cap them underwater. And then you're gonna confirm that you don't have any bubbles in them. Um, once you've done that, that's just the process of collecting the sample. Then you're gonna add a sequence of reagents in what's called fixing the sample. And so that essentially establishes the dissolved oxygen level so it can't change. And, um, and there's about uh, three different reagents that are involved in fixing the sample. And then finally, what you're gonna do is you're gonna do what's called titrating the sample. So you take your fixed sample, you pour a measured amount into what we call a titration tube. You're gonna add another reagent called starch indicator, which will cause it to turn color. And then you're gonna draw up uh, this particular reagent, sodium thiosulfate, into that little syringe looking thing, thing that's called a direct reading titrator. And the reason it's called a direct reading titrator is that this whole reaction is set up so that um, with the gradations on that little titrator, that little syringe looking thing, if you add, if you get 9.2 on the syringe, that tells you that you've added, or that tells you that your dissolved oxygen at the end is 9.2 uh, parts per million. So that's essentially what this whole test is engineered to do is to make it so at the end, you can just read off that little titrator and, find out what your dissolved oxygen result is. And the, the place where you read it is if you look at that titrator, you can see there's a little kind of a flat mark that's even with the zero there. And so that's the point at which you read the level uh, on the titrator. So then, as I mentioned, you, you drop that uh, sodium thiosulfate in the direct reading titrator, and then you're gonna add it Ultimately, you're gonna finish up your reaction by adding it a drop at a time, and you're looking for color change. So it gradually goes from dark to kind of a lighter blue to ultimately totally clear. And once you get to that point where you're totally clear, then you read your parts per million off the titrator. So we're gonna watch a demonstration video of uh, the different parts of dissolved oxygen. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch instructional video series. This video will show the proper method for collecting and fixing a sample used to determine the dissolved oxygen in water. This video corresponds to step A and step B in the water chemistry manual. There is a separate video for step C, titrating the sample. For this step, you will need the two water sampling bottles from your kit. Two replicate samples for dissolved oxygen must be taken to ensure precision. Replicates are two samples collected at the same time and place. You will use both water sample bottles in your kit. Uncap the bottles and rinse two to three times with water from your site. To fill the bottles, hold them upside down in the same hand and submerge them below the surface of the water. Avoid disturbing the bottom of the stream. Allow the sample bottles to fill while completely underwater. 
move or shake the bottles to allow all air bubbles to escape. Invert caps and cap the bottles upside down while they are still submerged. Remove the capped bottles from the water and invert them to make sure no air bubbles are trapped inside. If air bubbles are present, even if they are only in one bottle, empty both sample bottles and refill them with water again. Once a satisfactory sample has been collected, proceed immediately with the next steps. For this step you will need manganous sulfate, alkaline potassium iodide azide, and 1 to 1 sulfuric acid. Each of the following steps should be done for both samples collected in step A, one after the other. Some of the reagents used for this step are hazardous. Children using these chemicals should be carefully supervised. Make yourself aware of and adhere to the recommended Alabama Water Watch safety protocols. Also remember to hold reagent bottles vertically to ensure uniform size drops. Locate the manganous sulfate bottle. Uncap your samples and add eight drops of reagent to each. Locate the alkaline potassium iodide azide bottle and add eight drops to each sample. Cap the bottles and rinse the outsides to remove traces of reagents that the bottles may have come in contact with. Mix the bottles by inverting at least 10 times. At this point, a tan, cloudy precipitate will form. Allow the precipitate to settle below the shoulder of the bottles. This may take a few minutes. Locate the 1 to 1 sulfuric acid bottle. Add 8 drops to each sample. Cap bottles and rinse the outside. At this point, the sample will contain dark brown flecks. Repeatedly invert the sample bottles to mix until most of the flecks have dissolved. Be patient during this step. Brown flecks in DO bottles may take several minutes to dissolve, especially in cold water. It may be helpful to begin sampling your site with the dissolved oxygen test so that other tests may be performed while waiting for DO reactions to complete. Your final sample should resemble apple juice or tea. At this point, your samples are now fixed. This means the oxygen in the sample is chemically trapped and that contact between the water sample and the atmosphere will not affect the test result. Please watch the second dissolved oxygen instructional video to see the proper method for titrating your samples. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, give us a shout. Any questions on that part? Okay, we'll move on to part B. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch instructional video series. This video will show the proper method for titrating water samples that have already been fixed for the dissolved oxygen test. This video corresponds with step C in the water chemistry manual. There is a separate video for steps A and B, collecting and fixing the sample. For this step, you will need a titration tube, starch indicator, sodium thiosulfate, and the direct reading titrator. This entire process should be completed for one sample before starting the second sample. Locate the titration tube in your kit. Rinse the tube two to three times with a small amount of the fixed sample from the first water sampling bottle. Waste can be put in a waste container or broadcasted in a vegetated area. Fill the titration tube to the 20 milliliter line with the same fixed sample.
Locate the starch indicator in your kit. Add eight drops to the tube and gently swirl to mix. The sample should turn dark blue to black. Cap the titration tube with the corresponding cap. It should have a hole in the center. Locate the direct reading titrator and the sodium thiosulfate bottle in your kit. Depress the plunger on the titrator and insert into the hole in the top of the sodium thiosulfate bottle. Invert both the bottle and the titrator. Pull the plunger on the titrator until the large ring on the plunger is opposite the zero line on the scale. Make sure there are no air bubbles in the titrator. Bubbles may be removed by moving the plunger up and down while the bottle of sodium thiosulfate is inverted. Insert the filled titrator into the center hole of the titration tube cap. Add one drop at a time from the titrator, gently swirling the tube between drops. You do not need to count the drops for this test. Continue adding one drop at a time until the dark solution turns clear. During the titration, if the plunger tip reaches the bottom line on the titrator scale before the solution is clear, refill the titrator to the zero line with sodium thiosulfate and continue the titration. If you have to refill, be sure to add 10 parts per million to your second parts per million value and record the total value required for the titration. Hold the tube against a white background to be sure that the solution is clear and not faint blue. Read the number on the titrator where the widest part of the plunger meets the line on the scale. Each minor division on the titrator scale equals 0.2 parts per million. Record the value to the nearest 0.2 parts per million. Repeat these steps for the second sample bottle. If the two DO results are not within 0.6 parts per million of each other, season and refill the titration tube with leftover fixed sample from the first sample bottle and follow the titration steps. If the results still vary by more than 0.6 parts per million, repeat the entire procedure with new samples of water from the site. Leftover sodium thiosulfate in the titrator could have been contaminated with the water sample and should be discarded. Do not return the leftover titrant to the bottle. Thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, give us a shout. Welcome to the Alabama Water Watch Instruction. Okay, any questions on that whole process? It seems kind of complicated, but once you've gone through it a couple of times, you kind of get used to the steps. And so all these tests <clears> that we've been watching, <clears throat> excuse me, in this video, in this series of videos and talking about, um, my wife and I monitor two sites monthly, and it takes us about 20 minutes per site to do all the tests. So once you get up to speed, it's really, it's pretty straightforward. But initially, like when we go out and do our training, um, it'll probably take us a couple hours to get through everything, just walking through everything slowly and making sure everybody's following all the steps. Okay, well, we only have a couple other things to go over for the rest of our class here. So um, we've watched the videos. Um, the other concept with dissolved oxygen is a, is a concept of what's called dissolved oxygen saturation. And essentially, that means that at a given temperature, water can hold a certain amount of dissolved oxygen, actually at a given temperature and pressure. So elevation is a factor, but that's not something we usually have to control for. So for instance, on this chart at, uh, let's say that we were monitoring and our temperature was eight and our dissolved oxygen um, theoretical maximum would be 11.83 at, a temperature of eight degrees Celsius. So then we'd go, okay, um, we actually found a dissolved oxygen of 10. So dividing, I'll just get my calculator. If it was 10 divided by 11.83, we'd say, okay, we're at 8.845 or eight, approximately 85% dissolved oxygen saturation. So we're just trying to see uh, how saturated are we compared to normal, which is really um, 
the reason why that number is important is that it needs to be a certain amount of saturation, but it can't be super saturated. Usually the only place that you typically would ever find something like super saturated water would be like at the base of a dam. But it's, it's another way that we interpret our results. So now you've gone through all the tests and as you go along, you record them on your data sheet. And then there's a place on the Global Water Watch database that essentially corresponds with the data sheet where you enter all your data. And that's it. Now you, you, you're done. So now you can take your data, interpret it, do whatever you're gonna do with your data, but you've, you've finished your monthly water chemistry sampling.